Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are coming to you live from our respective homes all over the country tonight. Uh, I wish we were all gathered together in real time uh, to celebrate this amazing book uh, because it's a real piece of art, and it's. We were just talking about how heavy the book is and how tangible it is and how um exciting it is so i'm gonna get y'all to hold it up but it's a it's a really solid beautiful um piece of art and uh so we're having a little bit of av troubles but tim is with us we're gonna be able to hear him and uh, we're gonna do our best to you know show show pictures and and have this conversation so that you can enjoy it and hopefully his visuals will come back in we apologize for the inconvenience of that um i am going to go ahead and introduce everybody um but first i want to thank our Auburn Avenue Research Library co-sponsors, um, and specifically our research librarian co-host tonight, who is already in the chat, dropping knowledge and dropping links. Um, we love this partnership. It's so fun. What I want to let you know is those links will be up in perpetuity. You can come back to this URL at any time. So don't feel pressure to click all the links. They'll just be there. So pay attention to the conversation. Know that the links will be there. And then you can come back and scroll through and find out more resources. The Auburn Avenue Research Library is closed for browsing, but is open online 24 seven. You can also reserve an appointment with a research librarian. You see that they have dropped their email in the chat. Um, it's an amazing time to do your own work. So they have some really cool um, like superhero collection, comic collections, all kind of stuff that um, you might want to dig into. So um, go ahead and, you know, in your free time, as you're, you know, if you're home, kind of like wishing that you could be out and about going to different art exhibits and things like that, check out what AARL has to offer because it's really an amazing collection. So uh, I want to introduce first Ed Hall. Uh, Edward Austin Hall is an Alabama escapee and lifelong Southerner. He co-edited the 2013 anthology Mothership, Tales from Afrofuturism and Beyond, which the magazine of fantasy and science fiction suggested might be one of the most important science fiction anthologies of the decade. And his new novel, Dread Isle, is out now from Karis, uh, at Karis, and we're going to be celebrating it at Karis next month, February 2nd. So be sure to keep an eye on that. Ed is going to be our moderator tonight for a conversation um, with Victor Laval. Victor is the author of the short story collection, Slap Boxing with Jesus, four novels, including The Ecstatic, Big Machine, The Devil in Silver and the Changeling, and two novellas, Lucretia and the Croons and The Ballad of Black Tom. He is also the creator and writer of a comic book, Victor Laval's Destroyer. He has been the recipient of numerous awards, like a ton of awards, so I'm not gonna name them all, um, but we have, you know loved every book that victor has put out and uh, we're really glad to have victor here tonight so thank you for being here um and we're here tonight to celebrate the work of tim fielder tim is an illustrator cartoonist and animator raised in clarksdale mississippi he is the founder of diesel funk studios a multimedia storytelling company he is also an educator for institutions such as the new york film academy and howard university Tim has served clients such as Marvel, TriStar Pictures, Ubisoft Entertainment, and The Village Voice, and is known for his TEDx talk on Afrofuturism. His work has been showcased in the Hammonds House Museum, just down the street, and he won the 2018 Glyph Awards. He attended Jackson State University, School of Visual Arts, and New York University. So welcome, Tim. We are so glad to have you. you here and so glad to be celebrating this book with you tonight. I know everybody's going to want to buy a copy so you'll see this green link down at the bottom of your screen that's where at any time you can click that link we will send you out a copy or if you're local to atlanta you can pick it up safely and socially distantly on our front porch um, the final thing i'm going to let you know is that you can click this ask a question box down at the center of your screen at any time go ahead and you know put your questions in at any point and ed will assimilate them into the conversation as we go along but uh, it's a real pleasure to have all three of you here and all of you at home in the chat. Um, please make yourselves comfortable. And uh, I know we're in for a great conversation. Thank you, ER. Uh, Tim. Yes. Victor, good to 
good to be in your presence again, even if it's only telepresence. Yes, okay. indeed. And alive. It's, it's been a while, yeah. <laughs> yes, it, that's it, right. You were kind of to get to the as being a thing <laughs> come 2021. So, yes. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's truly good to be here in every sense. Mm hmm. I'm going to dive right in and and uh, leap to the end of infinitum. Um, and and I, I, I hope I have this right. This is the Arthur J. Fi afterward, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, where he writes, imagine the shock and horror of the world's oligarchs who pay millions to professional futurists when Black Panther, that's the movie, made $1.3 billion at the box office. Right. Could you, I know this, this is not your afterword, but well, talk about talk about why Arthur J. Fo specifically is referring there, you think, to horror. Right. Okay, so what you just cited is actually my quote from Okay, Lee. okay great. No problem, no yeah. problem, no problem, no yeah, problem. Yeah. So, I, I will tell you what I meant by that. That article yes, uh, was written on the economy of Afrofuturism. And the economy of Afrofuturism is a scenario in which uh, as forms, cultural forms develop, they have products around. So Victor is a fiction writer, right? So what is it, uh, Ballad of Black Tom, right? You wrote this book, so that's a product. As those products develop, and then you begin to uh, uh, move farther down the 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 line, uh, begin to deal with different storylines, entering in different equations, narrative equations. Then the economy develops around that content that I'm self-supporting. Does that make sense? What I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I I hope that answers your question. Yeah, um, I, I think I think I'm curious too uh, to get horror is not something uh, that's not a word I see invoked outside of, for example, you know, people talking about the aftermath of explosions or, right, or right, plane right. crashes, mm -hmm. um, and I just found it an interesting term. Or when we're talking about the, the genre of horror, of horror right. writing, right? So I, I think I'm focused on that primarily, right. and I, it just interests me that that you would uh, characterize the reaction of incredibly wealthy people who are, you know, perhaps running certainly the capitalistic world. Sure. Right. So, um, what what was it again? Um, why the why horror in particular? Well, the horror because uh, these people who spend lots of money. Uh, to have people project trends that are coming. You know, yeah. what's going to be next? They mm -hmm. spend money on this. There are think tanks all over the world, you know, governmental agencies, NGOs, all involved in it. And they hire these people who have these PhDs to come in and say, oh, okay, uh, by the way, this is the type of food we're going to be eating. Uh, okay, we're running out of land, so we need to start investing in vertical farms, that type of thing. And as an Afrofuturist, part of what I do is I integrate those things into what I'm doing. Now, when you take the horror element, so I'm paying you millions of dollars to predict what's going on. Then Black Panther happens. Making $1.3 billion. But no one told me. Because these futurists are not studying that material. So the horror is that someone's paying a futurist to predict what's going on. But they missed that totally. That's a big miss. That's like missing like the moon. You yeah. see it in the sky. It's there. Yeah. So that's yeah. what I meant by the horror. That that's lovely. Thank you. That that really gets right at the heart of it. I think. <laughs> so, um, I, I I should note that in preparation for this, I read both your right your both of works by both of you that are firmly in the medium of comics. So, and both Destroyer, Victor's book Destroyer, uh, which was a comic series and now compiled, uh, and Infinitum have 
in one or more immortal characters. Each of the, each book has one or more immortal characters in it. So, uh, Victor, maybe you could start out and talk like what what for you without spilling the beans, say, you know, not not spoiling the story, but what what does immortality as a metaphor? Why does that resonate for you here? Right. Well, I, I want to. I want. I definitely want to answer that. But I, I do want to throw out like one other thing that, based on your uh, the Black Panther question, and, yeah, and, uh, Tim's quote, Please. just a tiny nugget of information that I believe is the is the case that I find so fascinating uh, in uh, as far as like how do these things even come to be is that the only reason on so, potentially that Black Panther even existed is because uh, apparently at Marvel um, they had one black executive who was in those meetings with Kevin Feige when they were all sitting around and saying like, what are the other projects we should be developing? This is say like in the Iron Man, early Thor and first Avengers days. And that whole room is throwing out all these things. How about Ant-Man? How about this? How about uh, the Wasp? This and then this one black executive says, what do you know about Black Panther? And then Feige goes like, oh yeah, Black Panther, I like him. You really think it's gonna be, gonna have legs? And that this one black executive was like, please trust me. Every the Black Panther, the world is ready for Black Panther to be on the right. screen. Right. And just that idea that like, uh, I mean, I just love that story for the way that it, um, to that point is like, to Tim's point, like uh, if you don't have anyone in the room predicting the future, absolutely, who is of one of the people who is going to be a part of the future, then that's it, then you miss, you miss yeah. the reality of what, yeah. you miss that one, I mean, and even on a capitalist level, you miss taking $1.3 billion to the bank, right? And even on that level, you sort of say like, that's, you know, I feel like um, in the wake of that, of Black Panther, and in the wake of say, in the horror field, in the wake of Get Out, uh, what most sort of made people say like, oh, there's black uh, futurism, or there's black comic books, or there's black horror was, there's money, right? And for better or worse, that is the thing that opens yeah. all the doors yep. uh, um, in the corporate world, you know? I know that was not the question. Moore. Yes. Dig in, Tim? Yes. Nate Moore is the executive that Victor is speaking of. Ah, Nate Moore, yes, okay. I didn't know his name, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. But no like, problem. you know what I mean? Like, just uh, it's amazing. Anyway, so uh, I just wanted to throw that out there because I thought it was such an interesting uh, part of things. But as far as immortality goes, um, my book is uh, sort of an ex a continuation of the Frankenstein story. And the heart of that story is that there is this being, Frankenstein's monster, um, who in theory can live forever, right? But by the end of the story, it's a tragedy that he can live forever. And I felt like for my story, I was going to have, in this case, a young black boy as the sort of new monster for lack of a better term, the new creation. And I did not want a tragic outcome for his immortality. You know, I thought there was something hopeful about the idea, the Afrofuturist idea, you know, one of them, that like, we're there too. There's black people in space. There's black people in the future. Right. And so that was at the heart of it. Right. Yeah. Um, what about you, Tim? Yeah, well, for me, uh, I, I would uh, 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 second what uh, 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 Victor said, uh, but in my specific case with Infinitum, the key was I wanted to do the blackest book possible. <laughs> yeah. You know, I want to do the blackest book possible. So the main character is going to live. And black people will be present and they will be active. They will have agency. Uh, the sisters are going to be amazing, uh, uh, and 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 you will have black families, and you will have black villains, and you will have black heroes, and the, and the hero will be uh, all about redemption. He will make mistakes, but he will be about action. And so I wanted to show that in a book. But when it comes to the immortality part, the key was worked on multiple levels. One, it's a very useful uh, storytelling device. It allowed one character to live through multiple iterations of history, both past, present, and future. 
Uh, so that's the first. Second thing is uh, when I say I want to do the blackest book possible, Doro. Doro from Wowsy. Yeah. It's like the immortal. You know what I'm saying? And part of what I was doing with this book was not just trying my best to tell my own story, but to pay homage to all of the Afrofuturists who are my colleagues, the ones who came before me. Uh, that's what I wanted to do. So uh, there are many different aspects, Easter eggs, I guess is what they call them, where you can, uh, you can pick out elements that are a homage to other ideas and concepts and stories by other folks, and that's that's what that was. Yeah, yeah, I I I, I caught at least two of those for sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that really amused me, and I and I love the I love the idea that right you have to have some sense of history and or folklore mm -hmm. to to get the ones I'm thinking of. I'm not going to spoil yeah. them here because mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're fun to sort of untangle. Um, uh, so, uh, Tim, I, you want to talk about how you came to this book? Because you're, so you and I, Tim and I met, uh, I, I was invited to be like interview him in a situation similar to this at a, during a, 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 a sit down in front of an audience at the Hammonds House Museum in Atlanta. Um, was that 2019? That was 2018. I can give you, let me ask you a question, I'll give you the breakdown. Let me ask you a question, I'll give you the breakdown. Yeah. So basically I created Infinitum uh, as a story uh, about an immortal back in the early 2000s. Yeah, and that story uh, I've worked on it a few times. You know, Victor knows when you're working in comics, you have different iterations when you're dealing with visual storytelling. Uh, I'm a visual Afrofuturist, so meaning I tell my stories with an interplay between words, pictures. You know, that's the that's the dangerous dance. And in this particular case, what I did was I was telling my 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 second oldest brother. You know, we're, we're walking down, and I've said this before, but hey, it's, it's in the text. Said, we're watching, walking to Magic Johnson's Theaters on 125th Street in Harlem, and I started telling them the story of 139th, where I used to live, and by the time we got to 125th, I had told them the entire story. He said, man, that story is great. And I said, thank you. So I started trying to do it, but at that time, because I spent maybe 12 to 15 years outside of the comic book industry. I, I did about 10 to 12 years in the comic book industry prior, but I was in video game design and animation. So I started doing that work again and uh, was dealing in animation and created another character called Maddie's Rocket and then got back into comics. Uh, when I got back to comics, uh, you know, the Afrofuturism thing, visual Afrofuturism is what I call it. That's what Black Panther is. Uh, get it out is visual Afrofuturism, you know, with a, perhaps a, a heavy, heavy dollop of horror and ethnogothic elements. But um, so what happened was uh, the New York Times did a story on Afrofuturism that featured me in it. And I was, it was intended for me to, uh, 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 to draw some images for it and they asked me to submit some storylines. And one of the things I did was I submitted Infinite. And at the time it was only 28 pages long. Mm -hmm. And of course, Black Man is the mortal God wasn't gonna go over too well with the crowd. <laughs> so they sit down here back, and next thing you know, I was, you know, I was in the story, but the art wasn't there. And I didn't want to throw anything in, you know. Throw anything together because I'm I'm a I'm a child of the Bandesine artist, the Mobius, Nicky Blau, Richard Corbin. I do fully rendered work. I want you to see the the pimples on somebody's nose, that type of thing. That's where I rock and I do my work. So I kept going, and then we had started Black Metropolis in 2016, which is a, a career retrospective of all of my work uh, uh, that was done in New York galleries and gall galleries. Then it was resurrected at the Hammers house and that's where you and i talked yeah and by the end of that show over a two-month period i entered into discussions with harper 
Collins on the spot. Uh, Tracy Sherrod was my editor, and uh, she lost her mind and, and bought my book. <laughs> <laughs> she lost her mind and bought my book. I know she's like, oh, Lord, what did I do? But uh, she did it. And uh, 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 it is the uh, uh, it is a, a a a huge milestone for me personally and professionally, but I think it's also a huge milestone for for our our field, our line of work. I think so too. Uh, I was not prepared, e even though I, I correct me if I'm wrong. I saw images from infinitum in the hammond's house show right yes yeah and so i didn't realize what the format would be yep so i was very surprised i don't think it's a spoiler to say that it's pretty much an image per page oh mm -hmm. uh, right and yep. which is a a, a, a sort of startling way to do comics uh that's it, it has that's much more that has mu that approach has much more in common with what you would see in that cousin of comics and that's children's illustrated books yes thank you victor my copy is i, I feel like you just can't uh you can't enjoy it until you see it you can't appreciate yeah, it yeah and 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 i we it. were talking about it we were talking about the the physicality of the book i should tell you tim I am uh, one of my one of my vices as a book collector is I love the smell of certain inks, mm -hmm. so I can I can actually d discern some books from other books. Mm -hmm. But this is the first ink that I had never smelled before in a lot of years, like decades. <laughs> so right, this book has its own bouquet, and it's lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah and, and you know perhaps that is the plight of visual Afrofuturist. That is our plight. Uh, we have been around for many, many years. Yes. Uh, we have produced for many, many years, but we have not been so much in the mainstream. Uh, uh, and and you know, we've been there. So and, and we come from all backgrounds. Pedro Bell, Overton Lloyd, uh, Turtel only. Uh, uh, you know, and then you have the contemporaries, I guess, my contemporaries with uh, Machindo and uh, Gray Williamson, uh, James Eugene, uh, you know, and then some of the younger dudes like Eric Wilkerson. So there's a history of visual Afrofuturism out there. You know, Jason Reeves, it, there is visual Afrofuturism in indie comics, for sure. But now that the mainstream industry, in terms of the publishing industry of the big four, uh, uh, the big, well, it used to be big five, but big four, I guess Infinitum is sort of like the first time one of those big projects is coming out. And uh, so uh, I'm your guinea pig. <laughs> um, these two books start in uh, in very interesting places to me. Um, if I'm, if I'm seeing what I think I'm seeing, you, you could interpret the, the very first page of infinitum as the big bang. Is that? Yes. Yeah. So, um, and given where it ends mm -hmm. and I won't spoil the ending, um, <laughs> Um, I, I, I think that horror is not a, an inappropriate thing to, mm -hmm. to uh, even as it's firmly in the mold of Afrofuturism. There's mm -hmm. a fair patch of horror in this, as there is in Destroyer. Mm -hmm. um, Victor, do you know a, a Howard Waldrop, Stephen Utley story called Black as the Pit from Pole to Pole? No. I mean, I know the poem. Uh, right, Invictus. Right. Yeah, yes. the, the, it, that that title comes from uh, from the from the poem Invictus. This is a '70s story that I read in an old Terry Carr collection. It made the rounds. I think uh, Robert Silverberg first published it in New Dimensions. Write but it, it, down. It, it features the Frankenstein monster. Where that story ends is almost exactly where Destroyer begins. That's why I asked. Ah, interesting. Right? Okay. It, it ends uh it ends with uh whale and Frankenstein. Huh. 
I did. So, I had, that's uh, fascinating. I did. I, uh, I just yeah. wrote it down because I'll have to look it up. But uh, it was not a uh, a conscious uh, inspiration yeah. at yeah. the very least. The but that's uh, interesting. That start that that opening image uh, of the Frankenstein monster perched atop a clearly towering iceberg. Yeah. Um, why, why there? Why that image? Uh, well, I, I guess uh, first, you know, on the level of uh, like uh, to dazzle, I wanted like and the promise of things I wanted when a reader opened the book, I wanted to them to know like this is a Frankenstein story, right? To like show them uh, to sort of make the promise up front that this creature was a part of things. Um, and to be, but to be secretly hiding that, but he's not the point of yeah. the story. And in fact, what yeah. we're going to do is come to the present and meet this black woman who's the modern Frankenstein scientist, mm -hmm. and then her son who is the modern creation. Uh, but I did feel like it was necessary to have an opening image uh, that uh, Dietrich Smith, uh, the artist, like I just wrote, um, we see the creature sitting on a, an iceberg, right? But it was Dietrich who brought that sense of almost like a dead king sitting yeah. on his throne, right? Uh, yeah. That that immediate majesty was, you know, like the, the, the beauty of uh, getting to collaborate with really talented visual artists is that I write the sentence, the creature sitting on an ice iceberg, he gives me that thing and I go, oh, that's so much better than anything I was gonna suggest. And it, and it would take me 10 pages to describe yeah. what he what he can do in a great image, right? And that's, I mean, the beauty of the, at least from my perspective, the beauty of entering into the comic art form is that the writer, I do think, the writer humbles themselves before the artist, right? Or if it's gonna go well, uh, yeah. rather than trying to fight the artist, that's Take not the case in regular comics, man. <laughs> I know they that's right. Crazy. They crazy. I know that's right. I have and, heard stories. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> hey, man, back when I was in the comic book industry in the 80s, artists yeah. were the king. We yes. were the masters. We yes. determined what the flow was. It wasn't Chris Claremont and John Byrne. It was John Byrne and Chris Claremont. Mm -hmm. So I left out of the industry in 99, right? Mm -hmm. And when I got back, all of a sudden, everything had flipped. Suddenly, the writers were in charge, and the artists were like these second-class citizens. I felt like Charlton Heston. You remember at the end of the age when he's, yeah. you know, he's on the horse with Nova's on the back, and he's walking, and he's looking. He's oh my god, you did it! You goddamn you are alive! That's what it was. So that's what I felt. Like. So now I'm like, you know, it's like. I love writers. Don't get me wrong. Writers are awesome. You guys make the world run. There's a chat here with writers. You know, the internet is 80% writing, 80% <laughs> words. Bad grammar, but it's 80% words. But the pictures, man, mm -hmm. you know, we you know, we do our thing too. So that's what we're doing. Anyway. For sure. Mm -hmm. Well, in the past, so in the uh, if I could throw in a question then when you came back and that was how things flipped, how did you, um, what was the adjustment like to see it have gone from? <laughs> I said I was in the sand and I was beating on the sand going, oh my God, you did it. You yes, it you're right. That was it. You blew it up. <laughs> That's what it was, man. Yes. But, so uh, anyway, uh, you know, I'm a little bit older. I'm not a young man anymore. So what I had to do, I made a few missteps when I came back because I've been back in the game now for about six years, six mm -hmm. going on seven years. And I made the slight misstep when I first got back. I was, oh, my God, I'm back in comics. I took everything, uh -huh. any option, any job I could take. And then uh, 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 I became, uh, what is it, uh, uh, my, my uh, uh, friend uh, David Walker said, you become overcommitted. Mm. And once I became overcommitted, that was the end. So I was throwing off books, messing up. I see. But one thing that kept going was Maddie, Maddie's rocket. Mm -hmm. And then Finitum kept going. So I knew after a point that I only have the time, the bandwidth, and the space to do my own work. Right. As a visual Afrofuturist, 
my story is to tell narratives with both visual and written word component uh, to 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 kind of speak up at least for a moment on what Ed, what you were saying regarding one panel per page, that that was done for two or three different reasons. First reason is I had the decision of either to do nine, a five to nine panel per page book fully rendered, and it would take me 10 years to do it fully painted. So that's the first thing. Second thing, uh, uh, one page, panel per page is easy to do than five panels a page. Right. And then three, people are spending money for this book. They are paying to see my work. And that is a, it, that's a privilege for me. So I could have released Infinitum as a regular black and white book. I could have done that. I mean, I showed you the breakdowns, mm -hmm. the black and white breakdowns. I could have done that. We may you have know, lost. I, yeah. Him. I could have. I'm sorry. Can you guys hear me? I hear you. Okay. Well, I'll keep talking. So. I I think we I, may have lost Ed. Yeah, we may have lost Ed, but it's okay. Yeah. I'll talk. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I do. It's about trying to de to deliver value to these readers. You yeah. know, you know how it is. How do you do? Shoot. I got to nail this ending. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. Does that, does, does that make sense? What I'm saying? Everything I heard, everything that that last little bit, I got a nail, and then uh, it kind of went, it got fuzzy for a second. Um, nail the end. Nail the end. Okay, well that was very straightforward. Yes, and you did. I mean, I have to say, like uh, I really like reading through the book. Uh, like one of the joys for me, number one was this the scope, right? Like just the way I felt like it was like quasi historical story. Then it was a, a science fiction story. It was all along, it was a sort of family story. Uh, and then it was also a, a like as time goes by in the story, it turns into like a almost metaphysical story, you know? That's my um, brother Victor. Watch <laughs> Thank you so much, brother Victor. Then you go. <laughs> but it, it. it was all of those, like that was one of the things that made me so excited about the book is that. Thank you. You, you you can't hold it into one. You can't put it into one category. Thank you. You know. Thank you. Yeah. No. Is uh, uh, I really was amazed. And then just to Ed's point uh, before he dropped off, I even thought like I understood where we were going toward the end. And again, I agree with Ed. I don't want to ruin it for anyone who's here uh, listening because you definitely want to read it and get it, buy it, and read it yourself because it's such a journey. But even like the li the that last little turn. I loved that it was, I think another kind of person would have gone for the really simplistic end. Oh, and I wanted to. Yeah. I wanted to. <laughs> okay. I, I remember forget. I was sitting in the studio and I was like, man, you know, I, you know, I don't want to do this. It's, 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 it, you know? Yes. And it's like, you gotta. You gotta. You gotta. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, well, it's the funny thing was like, my first reaction actually was like angry at you uh, because I felt like, oh, come on, just give him that. Nope. And then I loved, but then at the minute I put the book down, I said, but the point is not to sort of like just make it all sweet and nice. The point is to say, you know, on some level, like the journey never ends for us, right? Like it never, we, it never ends. Uh, yeah. I, I've said this before and I'll say it again. My, uh, I had a meeting with my editor towards the end of the editing of the book. Uh, 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 and, uh, 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 she said, well, why did Oba suffer as he does? Why mm -hmm. did he live like that? And I said, it is because we are not meant to live forever. We're meant to die and decay, providing sustenance for those who come after us. And that is a biological movement. And when you can expand that from the body to our homes, to our cities, to our societies, right? Yeah. We are eventually going to, you can see the way it's going, we'll probably go away. Yeah. We may last 100 years, we may last another 1,000, 2,000 years. You don't know. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, is that nothing is meant to last forever. 
it's meant to be broken down to its composite part, component parts uh, on a, a molecular level, providing food. That's that's right. a horrible way to think of it, but it's true. Right. You know, uh, it's it's um, we're just matter, man. We're only here for a second. That's right. Does that make sense. Absolutely, absolutely. But I mean, I think like the the beauty of the if I could bring it back to the book, your book, like the beauty of the book is that like uh, the way that you summarize that, I think the danger could be that it seems like therefore it's all bad. There's no good. Just get through it. But mm -hmm. the book is a journey of highs and lows. Yes. You know, and that like that be, we're all uh, we're all exist for only a second in the scale of the the universe's life. Right, but the the book makes time for the idea. Yes, that there are cycles to everything. The cycles and to that, everything. Yeah, you know, as Q-tip said. Yeah. And, <laughs> hey, man, we got a reference for Q-tip in here. <laughs> I, I, as a fellow <laughs> Queens kid, I had to throw it in. Fantastic night, you know. But uh, no, uh, but uh, uh, that is it, you know, Victor. It's it's like. You plus, you know, and I come back to visual Afrofuturism again. There's so much, hey, uh, Ed, you're back with us. Hey, there's so much, right. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, there's so much that hasn't been done mm -hmm. with visual Afrofuturism. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, Black Panther is not the first black science no. fiction film, that's right, by any that's stretch, right. it's right. not. Uh, but it's the first time it showed us in a technologically advanced light with complete agency. Mm -hmm. First time on film that's been done, right? Now, there are people who have perhaps shown it a little bit in terms of comics, but it's the first time in film it had been done to that scale. For sure. And I have done this over the decades, you know, in my work. And I paid the heavy, heavy price for it. So to be allowed to do this particular book and to to do it the way I was allowed, it was a great privilege. But I wanted to, you know, leave it all. You know, I hate to use this quote because it was quoted by somebody who I consider not very nice. But you had to leave it all on the field. That's mm -hmm. what. I well, can I ask? Oh, sorry, Ed. Sorry, please. No, no, no go carry on. Uh, I'll well, catch up. I, I mean, I guess I just wanted to ask uh, about that editing process. As mm -hmm. you say, like this was uh, a real uh, something very special to be able to produce a book like this, the way you wanted to produce it, and for it to be such a beautiful piece of work, mm -hmm. right? On a uh, on a what do you call it a big five publisher or I guess now big four publisher big four, right mm -hmm. yes uh, and and I wonder like the 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 experience of working with Miss um, Sherrod and like that as part of the editorial process uh, if you I mean I, I would just be fascinated to hear about what the that process w was like if you were left to your own devices if you talked things over how'd it go. Uh, actually, a, a, a bit of both. Uh, okay. The initial stages were uh, I was left to my own devices. And of course, when I signed, I turned it into a full manuscript. The manuscript right. I think, was, oh my God, 140, 150 something pages. Uh, well, I'm sorry, 240 pages. It, it was already oh. there. Wow. Uh, and I ended up adding more pages to flesh the characters out and to do things. So I was left pretty much to my own devices visually yeah i wasn't you know they let me do my thing which you know hey i'm good at what i do so sure. whatever. that's right Hard decision yeah you know yes uh, from the words point that was something that was a bit more uh complex because mm. i turned the actual book in after finishing what i thought was complete uh in um november 20, 2019, mm. uh, turned the book in, uh, went through November, like, yeah, I turned the book in. I'm professional, man. I'm professional. <laughs> then we hit December, and I'm like, yeah, this Christmas is going to be awesome. I finished my book, book will be out, blah, 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 blah. And then, hey, the book's not finished. I'm like, what? So, you know, 
it, that was hard. <laughs> yes. That was very hard. Because, you, know, you know how it is. Someone tell you to rewrite something. Well, it's, it's not easy, but yeah. it's words. This every picture, I think, you know, I, that stuff hurt to do that stuff. Yeah. It hurt to do that. And sometimes you can't fix things with just words because mm -hmm. graphic novels and comics or picture books or storyboards, you know, well, not storyboards, but certainly picture books and children's books and, 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 and comics are about the interplay between words and pictures and the space between the panels. Right. So when you do that, it's it's a much more difficult lift, particularly when you want to delve in the spectrum of Afrofuturism, because you are oftentimes dealing with subject matter where it's been written about, but it hasn't been shown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's one thing to say, oh, by the way, uh, Oba, uh, you know, Oba grabs his master around the neck and crushes it. Right. It's another thing to show it. Right? Yes. Now, what happened with the editing when we had to go back, all of a sudden, things about, well, does the main character talk? The main character did not narrate in the in the finished version I turned in in uh, November 2019. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, he had a voice. Mm -hmm. The lovers had a voice. And these were important things that, you know, I, I consider myself, I mean, I'm not perfect, you know, as an artist, I'm not perfect as a human, but what I do try to do is I do try to attack every opportunity I can mm. to advance my story. So if having a section where the lover, the lovers, uh, you know, lovers that Oba has over time to express their backgrounds, to express who they are, if that's going to give me another opportunity to move the story of father to engage the reader, I'm going to take it. Yeah. And they did deepen, right? Because uh, they yes. also, um, I felt like the other pleasure of that was, I don't think, I mean, it already came out. I don't think it's ruining anything to say that uh, his journey is one of the immortal, yeah. right? And so there was something powerful about snapshots of mortals yes right and hearing yeah. about like here's just my little flash in time and as his journey continues um those different lovers and those like i they're in my head as we travel to this new experience or this new place and i remember oh that was a part of this journey too that person and they're gone right and that sense yeah. of knowing they were there because i heard them and i saw them and they're gone, but they're still in him. I, I thought it was very effective to, to get Thank that across. You. And in really two pages, right? An image and, uh, and some... Right. And some um, uh, right. It's about animation. economy. It's about economy. Yes. It's about economy. It's like uh, uh, all three of us here talking, we can accept the fact that, you know, we have parents, you know, uh, yes. whether your relationship is, and they're, they're eventually going to leave the planet. Mm -hmm. They just will. I have children, Victor, uh, you have children, and I don't know if you have kids, but they they get older, you know? My my youngest baby is, he ain't a baby, 20 years old, man. <laughs> you know, just do, you yeah. know, I don't have hair. He has like hair, hair, <laughs> you know, steel wool hair. It's, I'm like, man, you'll never go bald. But uh, it's, it's, I wanted to tap into that horror uh, by showing how despondent or disconnected or disenfranchised, really, a person would be just having that repeat over yes. and over and over again. And the way you do that is by using visual repetition, right? narrative repetition. It's the same thing you guys do, right? But you're doing it visually. So sometimes you don't have to write everything. Sometimes you show it. <laughs> right. No, no, I'm serious. I'm serious. No, that, and it, it has a different impact. Right. Yes. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? Sometimes you have a picture, you don't need words in it. But sometimes you want more words. So it's right. that constant, constant dance. So I, I should say that that the two words I never expected to see in this book mm -hmm. were Black Kirby. Okay. 
right? And they, they show up in a background almost yeah. like a like a billboard in yeah. a cityscape. Yeah. Talk, could you talk about Black Kirby for a bit? Sure. Uh, I want to do the blackest book possible. I wanted to put all my friends and all my family. I want to do put my colleagues in there. I wanted to make nod to uh, 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 people who I respect who had an impact on my life. You know, you know, I, I won't reveal too much, but you know, Samuel R. Delaney is a gay man. But I'm gonna put a little bit of that in there because I'm paying homage to him. You know, uh, Nalo Hopkins is one of the baddest science fiction writers on the planet, recent master, if I'm not mistaken, right? I'm going to pay respect to her. I'm going to pay respect to her, you know. Uh, my guys, you know, the Black Kirby guys, the 133 yard guys, you know, uh, uh, naughty kids at play, you know, I put them in there. No, don't nobody know what it is anyway, but it looks good. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I put it in there. That's why I put it in there. Yeah. You know, so that's what living as a Black person on this planet has to be is that very often you're taking things that detritus if you will and you're adding that to the pot it's a gumbo if you will yeah yeah um uh, when you right when you said detritus i was actually thinking about a movie i was tempted to ask you about earlier now i i I feel like I have to ask you. Go for it. Has, has either or both of you seen The Adventures of Pluto Nash? Yeah. But, Maybe a long I time have. ago. Yeah. Have, yeah. What about it? Yeah. What I'm I'm curious because that that movie kind of cycles in terms of right, like how people, what people think <clears> of it. <throat> and I I saw it the day it opened on my birthday. Right. Um. And I, I'm just I'm interested to hear what y'all's reaction to it is Rick if you remember anything about it I you know to be honest like I I think I'm trying to remember what I what age I would have been but I feel like my uncle took me to see it <laughs> and I just totally was just like can we go so so let me speak to that so Pluto there you're talking about the Eddie Murphy Pluto I am talking yes. about the Eddie so, Murphy Pluto. So, so we've had a Q-tip reference and now we have <laughs> Eddie Murphy this night is complete ladies and gentlemen I don't know where else we can go tonight <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> I love that the Pluto Nash link has already come up in the chat. I applaud you, right, librarian. So you know, let, let me let me. That's amazing. Uh, a little bit on the film thing, and we'll, I, you know, and I hope you don't mind. We might move a little bit away from Pluto Nash, but no, no, no. Film, I hope that Infinita will be made into a streaming series. That's what I want. I'm going to tell you why I want it. I want it because storytelling, visual storytelling, storytelling in general, you go from words, you go to audio, right? You go to animation, which are drawings and audio and pictures, right, together. Then you go to live action. The power of film and streaming is so vast and everyone has access to it uh now this is gonna sound really vain to say this but you know what i'm 54 years old let me do it (laughs) uh i want that because i want my work to be seen by as many people as humanly possible i even have my dream uh uh oh bye i even have him you know string a bell baby string a bell you know, I think he would be awesome. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I think that the stories that I tell, because I come from a family of filmmakers, I'm basically just making movies every time, but just doing it in comic book format. It's all this is all sequential storytelling anyway. You know, so part of what I'm doing is getting my stories done to the best of my abilities. Victor, you know all about this. Ed, you know all about this. And hoping that my work can have effect 
uh, and any other opportunity that comes up beyond that, I'm prepared to take it. Victor, uh, the talk about Dr. Baker. Uh, well, so in Destroyer, I mean, as I said, it's a it's a, a an update, a continuation of the Doctor Frankenstein, of the Frankenstein novel. And if there, if you're going to do a continuation of the Frankenstein novel, then uh, you got to have a Doctor Frankenstein. There you go. Uh, and so, in my case, uh, when I was trying to figure out who that Doctor Frankenstein would be, I felt like, uh, you know, um, in a way, the sort of story of Doctor Frankenstein as the um, the sort of epitome of like in in the case of the original novel a certain kind of white male uh, uh age of reason hubris right. uh had been done and uh, uh and in a lot of the sort of remakes of frankenstein personally i feel like they just rehash that point that idea again and again long after it's been sort of like uh, almost like accepted as a given that that kind of hubris is dangerous in that kind of person. And so when I was thinking about who the modern Dr. Frankenstein needed to be, I felt like, well, so it's not going to be this white guy. Uh, who is it going to be? And I felt right. like, okay, it's going to be, uh, I, for a second I felt like, okay, so it's going to be a black guy. And even that felt, to be honest, like a little uh, dull, mm -hmm. uh, in part because I felt like, Black male hubris has been explored too, right. plenty, and right. is uh, you know is uh, as much as it's an important idea. Uh, th I feel like I'd seen that too, and then I said, "What if I made it a black woman?" And uh, and then when I made it, when I made that shift, uh, the other sh the other thing it sort of it automatically opened. it opened up, and right. the other thing it opened up for me was that I didn't believe. That if I if she was a black woman scientist who probably had worked so hard to who would have had to have worked so hard if she was going to turn out to be the greatest nanotechnologist on earth, uh, I just didn't believe that her narrative was going to simply be it's bad to be ambitious, right, right? Yeah. or anything like that. And so then it suddenly opened up. I thought like, oh well, what if you had empathy for the mad scientist, quote unquote? Exactly. Like, what if something happened to turn her brilliance into something more rage-filled? And what would that be? And when I was working on it, it was probably 20, I think it was 2015 or 2016. Certainly wasn't the first time, but there was plenty of stories about um, black, black folks being murdered by the police, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and uh, more specifically, just the, the continuous heartache. I, feel, I hope I would have had it even before we had kids. But now that we have kids, I felt even more of seeing parents who have outlived their children because their children were murdered by the police and being up in some press conference and talking about, this was my child. This wasn't whatever you're trying to paint this this child, this person as, this was my child and I love them. And I suddenly thought like, oh, that's what happened to her. And it all of that sort of opened up the world uh, completely and suddenly made it that I realized like, oh, this is actually the story of Dr. Baker. And this is actually the story about like why when Dr. Baker decides that she wants to uh, destroy America, I agree with her. Uh, and the, the, the journey of the story is gonna be about like how we could understand someone would get there. And yet then she has her child who she's brought back, but that child is like the last bit of innocence for her, who is trying to in some way convince her there's still a reason to keep living and keep hoping. And that's and so it, it totally changed like from just a retelling of Frankenstein into um, a, a much more specific, a black mother and her, and her uh, black son and the ways that they are basically both trying to save each other from being destroyed by this country or this world. Wow. That's deep, bro. Yeah. Thanks, man. Um, Victor, are you also interested in seeing uh, some sort of adaptation of Destroyer? And if so, what would you? 
Oh, I, I, I would never, I would, I would only be interested in such a thing happening. Uh, but uh, I think in many ways, like, uh, um, if I could say like, this is, I don't know, maybe uh, Tim, I don't know what Tim's like, sort of like rights and contract are, right? Like, uh, I would love to see it happen, but it's not entirely my, like, I'm like a half owner yeah. of this product, right? Which was part of the deal. Um, right. And and the the folks who publish uh, Boom Studios have been very positive. Been uh, there have been some people who are interested in this and that, you know, and maybe something will work out. Maybe it won't. Um, it but, will. Uh, thank yeah. you. But in in Tim's case, I'm hoping, like I'm knocking on wood, if you can hear that, that Tim is the one who has the right to move this into the world. And uh, should there be when there is interest and when people come out, because then. Uh, um, you know, then it's really his ship to steer. Yeah, that's my hope. And your hope is 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 well founded. Sir. Well, I'm one. But I'm, I'm not going to go into all that. Okay, good. Not to talk I mean, about that. I'm not trying to talk about contract law, man. Yeah, yeah. But I'm just I'm saying Pluto Pluto Nash. Nash. contract law for the next hour. <laughs> that's about right. the book and Pluto Nash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, I mean, I'm just I'm happy to hear that because I, I I too would love to see this as like. I mean, the beautiful thing about the thing is, like the the book. If it was some version of the book itself, that's its own beautiful, like limited series. But but there's so much. The beautiful thing about the story is there's so much time we don't see that there's room for years of yeah. story, right? As well, right? Like it doesn't just have to be the events in the book. There's thousands of years in between each one. There could be more story and more story. I don't know. I mean, I believe that. Victor, I'm not you can have seasons. You can have seasons. <laughs> you. Right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> many, many seasons. Exactly right. At least five. Bro. At least five. That's At right. least five. <laughs> mm, um, so uh, I'm not sure. I, I don't think we established when we might want to start thinking about uh, questions. This, I'm, and, I'm up for it. Yeah, yeah, I'm up for it. And I'm scrolling through here. Um, if people have questions, this I should say while I'm looking, uh, honestly, the the thing that stuck with me from Pluto Nash, don't kick me to bring it up again. <laughs> I'm not kidding you, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, uh, I don't know if you remember the nightclub scene. You remember there's a nightclub scene in Pluto Nash? And they invented a dance for that movie. Oh. That is that was the scene that stuck with me. That that wow. I mean, because my mother was a choreographer, and I've done a little bit of choreography, and okay. so that scene really, like a lot of that movie to me, is a little somnolent. It's like it's it's walking in its sleep. In that one scene, that's mm -hmm. where where Pluto Nash, Pluto Nash literally leapt to life on screen for me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I was getting at mm -hmm. is, yeah, you know, it's a gigantic, you know, over budgeted thing with this famous black actor slash comedian at the heart of it doing a thing that's not necessarily what he was identified with. And then that movie was like the studio abandoned it. They didn't know mm -hmm. what to do with it. So they just didn't market it. Right. And so it, 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 they made it. It was a self-fulfilling thing that it would bomb. Right. And so it became known only as a bomb. Right. And that, you know, that's never fair to me. Plus, it's also not a, that's no way to, to, to a, approach any piece of culture. Because no matter how much money it made or how much money was, quote unquote, squandered on it, right, mm -hmm. there's always interesting stuff in it. Right. You're actually going to get me. I'm going to end up watching this movie again. I think I haven't seen it since it first came out, but I've yes. seen about Pluto Nash periodically. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen. Your time oh. for tonight is going That's right. To Everybody go watch. Go watch. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> so the, the request is out for questions. Right. While we're waiting for them to percolate up, mm -hmm. um, we, I think we might want to talk about influences. Okay. And so um, we talked about Black Kirby, right, mm -hmm. which gets a shout out in, mm -hmm. in, the, in, in, a, in the background of an illustration in Infinitum. <laughs> However, the afterword by Arthur Jacob talks about Jack Kirby, who right. I think we can never say enough about because Jack Kirby in many ways created the modern media landscape. Let's face it. I, I really get quite testy. I have a poem 
right. about Jack Kirby and what he suffered at the hands of Stan Lee. Sure. Let's be clear, right? Like Jack mm -hmm. Kirby was terribly, terribly exploited by the uh, writer. So, as well as you are, who <laughs> Jack Kirby was, or shall I do that? Um, Tim, you wanna you wanna have the honors of 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 doing what exactly now? The questions? You just just take just saying quickly like who Jack Kirby was because you have a really yeah. Point yeah Jack Kirby created all of the flagship Marvel characters. He created Hulk. Uh, he created uh, uh, Iron Man, uh, the Avengers. Uh, he created Thor. He created the Fantastic Four. And for many, many, many years, uh, he was not acknowledged. But that was resolved because Disney is smart. And now we got Fantastic Four coming back to us uh, very soon. And uh, Jack Kirby changed the world. Uh, obviously, I would not be doing what I'm doing without Jack Kirby. Uh, there would be much uh, uh, in Afrofuturism, which would not exist. I don't care what anyone says without Jack Kirby because he created Black Panther. You know? right. So um, that's who Jack Kirby is. Black Kirby is John Jennings and Stacey Robinson, the duo, and they reimagine and reformat the works. Uh, that's how they started, at least. Uh, of Jack Kirby's work. So it went from Galactus to Mo Blactus. <laughs> and uh, now, of course, they've gone off doing the other things, still re envisioning characters, but creating their own content. And uh, they're the ones who came to my studio back in 2014 when I was still trying to do animation. I'm still doing comics. I'm working with uh, Alex Simmons. I was in animation, but I was starting back to comics. They told me when I showed my work. I remember Stacy said the first thing that happens, this stuff needs to be published. Mm -hmm. So that's when I knew, okay, I gotta do this. And that was in 2014. And here we are oh well, almost seven years later. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. And thank God I did. Because I was a horrible animator. Let's be clear on that. <laughs> I was terrible. Why so? Uh well I mean, what do you okay. Well, I'll keep it brief. Animating in 2D is something I can do, and I find myself very good at animating characters in 3D is much more complex mm -hmm. because you're having to do things like rigging of polygons and stuff like that. And uh, I'm not wired like that, but I can model, like build 3D objects in Maddie's Rocket and in uh, 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 and, uh, uh, Infinite. The environments, many of the environments, they're built in 3D. I could model for 13 hours straight, just building environment, building vehicles, building props. And it's a heavy, heavy part of what I'm doing. And in fact, in the future, I'll be integrating a lot of Unreal uh, uh, Engine into my work because it's just time for it. That's what I do. Mm. I'm all digital. I don't draw on paper anymore, man. Okay. Wow. That's Who that paper, man. That paper's bad for your health anyway. That, that's a revelation all by itself, man. It is. Um, when, when, uh, when did you start? Working on the uh, on the on devices as opposed to uh, I went digital back in 1996. Oh, oh wow. my God! Really? Well, that, that's not true. That's not true. I went digital back in 1984. Was, was that <laughs> that's better and better. No, no, no. They had the Mac out at the time. I was at Jackson State University, and they had a computer, and they had the early early Mac Paint, and I was painting with a mouse. Huh. And I never forget, wow. it was so revolutionary. I was like, oh my God, I could draw on a computer, but I was drawing with a mouse and really primitive paint program. And I was drawing in my, this, the program uh, director's like, look, you got to get off this computer. I was like, why not? You know, I, I'm paying to go here and it's just yes. sitting up in the corner. Why can't I draw on the computer? And yes. their response to me was, you might break it. <laughs> You can't use it. You might break it. You might break yeah, it. Yeah, heaven forfend. So I ended up doing an unpublished, fully painted Dr. Dre graphic novel called A Dr. Dre Man with a Cold Cold Heart uh, for Marvel Music. It was never published. And I painted that thing entirely in gouache. And my brothers were warning me, yo, man, why don't you paint this in the computer? And I was like, nah, man, I want to feel. I want to need to feel the paint. And mm -hmm. I felt at the end I was about to die. And I, I went digital after that. I never turned back. Interesting. 
Man, you, 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 I think this comes up every time we talk, Tim. I have one of the items from the Marvel Music Program. Mm -hmm. It's a bad comic. I've never opened it. It was illustrated by Kyle Baker, and it came with an audio cassette. Yeah. Break the chain. You, what, you know what I'm talking about? Break the chain. <laughs> and break the chain. Right? Um, and I'm sure that cassette is unlistenable now, right? They do not age well. Right. But I do have it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I, you know. Do you have a tape? I'm tape? really interested to know what, do you know what all that program encompassed? Uh, are you talking about Marvel Music? Yeah. Uh, Marvel Music was, uh, uh, I think, set up by well, more Todd. Hey, dude, just in case you're listening. Um, was the editor in chief Carl Bowlers was the supervising editor who I drove him almost to madness because I was turning in pages a little bit later than he would like. Uh, but it was, and I forget the name of the other guy. Uh, I'm sure my friend Floyd can remind me who it was. But at any rate, it was a division of Marvel Comics that was designed to take music performers, you know, uh, uh, Billy Ray Cyrus, Onyx, and it would put them into comics. And uh, I remember the Bob Marley estate did uh, the uh, book with Gene Colan. It was pretty incredible. My friend Floyd Hughes did the Snoop Dogg graphic novel, which was never published. And I did the Dr. Dre one. So there was uh, several books came out, several books didn't because Marvel declared bankruptcy. And uh, they oh, it. yeah. So that explains a lot. Yep. So. That's why when my memoirs come out, it's going to be a lot of new stuff in there. <laughs> yeah, I bet. It's old. <laughs> um, wow. So do you, on, on the subject of music, okay. do, you, do you work with music in the background, Tim? Yes, I do. What music? Uh, yeah, uh, I have soundtracks. I use a lot of movie soundtracks. So mm -hmm. I go through YouTube, and what I'll do is I'll select movie soundtracks that uh, generally set the vibe of the scene and the story I'm working on. So, for example, Maddie's Rocket is based in a uh, 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 based in a, a fictional Jim Crow Buck Rogers type past. So for that, I listen to a lot of uh, John Barry's music. Uh, the Bond stuff, but not not yeah. the Bond stuff, but primarily the um, old uh, the stuff for like um, uh, somewhere in time, uh, those type of movies. Beautiful uh, dances with wolves. Beautiful brass soundtrack. So I'll use that for Infinitum. It was a lot of Chris Martinez. Mm -hmm. uh, who did work. Uh, who done the? He's done the soundtracks for a lot of uh, Soderbergh's work. Solaris was had one of the greatest soundtracks in history. I listen to a lot of my brother, Boston Fielder's work, or the herb alders out there who know Mother Wick because his stuff is always psychedelic and he's insane. So I use his work well. And uh, so, yeah, music is very, very important to what I do. Uh, Victor, what about you? I say, like, a, um, yes, but it's more like a, I might listen to something to put me in a mood, uh, depending on like what the scenes, what I'm working on. Right. Mm -hmm. If I needed to, if I need to get into a certain mood, for 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 whatever that hour, two hours, or whatever it is of writing that I'll do, I might listen to a little something, usually uh, instrumental, because um, the if the lyrics start to play, then I it yeah. just gets caught in my head, you know. Uh, so for a while, this this um, this book that I'm editing now that I thought was going to come out in 2021, but I think it'll come out in 2022. Uh, I was listening to, it's about uh, women homesteaders in wow. Montana in 1915. Wow. Uh, and I was, for whatever reason, I was just listening to lots of Alice Coltrane. Which uh, one? Which one? I, particularly Journey to uh, uh, Sat Satchinada. That, that is the Afrofuturist soundtrack. Yes. Well, it, 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 I mean, I just play that, like uh, two or three of those, and it would just get me into that. State. Let me, ask this. Let me ask you this. Have you listened to the Carlos Santana Alice Coltrane blends? No, I didn't know there were any. I use that stuff on Infinitum. It's like, I, it, it, in fact, 
in an early in when Infidite was like 120, 130 pages. Yeah, I had uh, with a uh, black uh, speculative arts movement with Ronaldo Anderson's thing. The first time I ever presented Infinitum was as sequential frames played on 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 in video, but I had that Carlos Santana, Alice Coltrane, uh, a collaboration. Uh, I forget the name of it, but it is like some of. And this was done in like 1972. Wow. Hmm. And I edited that stuff to those images, and it was almost like it was made for the images. Okay, so it's the two of them working together? Oh my God. Well, All right, I'll check it out. I didn't know it. Both yeah. of them are Buddhists. Yes, I knew that. Yes, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, they collaborated. Okay. Alice uh, was like, you know, Alice was like, you know, if, 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 if a film is ever done of my stuff, you know, I wanted the soundtrack to be like Alex Coltrane. I'm yeah. just saying. Yes. That, that's so great. Um, I'm happy to know about that one. I'm going to look it up you next. You got to check that out. Hey, I guarantee when you listen to it, you will be contacting me again. Trust All me. right. All right. Very, very excited. <laughs> uh, now, I, I, I should say, if, if anything, um, I'm always writing basic like crime stories with monsters in them. And if there's ever a chase scene, all my chase scenes are basically the Charles Mingus music. Uh -huh. Essentially, E's flat, I's flat too. There um, you go. So there is a question, and it's um, it's directed at Tim. I can ask it to both of you. Uh, Tim, yeah. what projects do you have coming up? Yes, I do have projects coming up. Uh, so Infinitum, uh, the main character in the book is, you know, he's a dude. You know, he has his issues like most dudes do. Uh, but the next one coming up, it's for the sisters. Don't worry about it, ladies. I have not forgotten you. Maddie's <laughs> Rocket will be back. And this time it's going to be in trilogy form. We're working out details, but don't worry. Maddie's Rocket will be back. That character is based on my great-grandmother named Maddie Waddy, action adventure star and a sister who has agency based loosely on the life of Bessie Coleman and Harriet Tubman. Mm. Uh, that's one. The other thing I'm doing is a project called Brother Robo which is my first middle grade project about uh, two huh. twins who have a giant robot friend. <laughs> and then, uh, hey, that's why I call it Brother Robo. Yes. And then the yeah, other one is uh, uh, Black Metropolis, which is my memoirs I spoke of earlier. Black Mid what? Metropolis? Black Metropolis. Oh, right. Uh, I I have, yeah, this is the this is a flyer from- Oh, uh, yes, that's right. Yeah. So that was from the show. What was that? Yeah. That, that, that what was that the the, the uh, you know the the sub I know 30 years I forget it was like man that was a little long but people loved it. <laughs> oh it, I, it's worth reading. 30 years of Afrofuturism, comics, music, animation, decapitated chickens, heroes, villains, and negroes. There you go. I, I, I love the line uh of yours, I put Negroes in space. Yes. <laughs> yes. Which is just crazy. You know, my friend Jerry Kraft said, you can't say that. But it was too late. I said it about 20 times. It's too late. There you go. It's too Victor, late. What are, what are your favorite projects, man? Well, the th I'm editing that novel about the homesteading women, and then uh, I'm working on a, another comic, um, uh, like a five-issue limited series uh, about a um, an 11-year-old. It's a kind of a climate change uh uh, horror wow. novel uh, and horror comic, and it's about an eleven-year-old girl who is uh, who's going to have to save the planet. Wow! I don't know, it's called Eve, uh, Eve. and uh, Eve. I mean, a little on the nose, but sometimes a little bit. But just name it. Just name it. Yes, and uh, so I'm working on that now. Uh, um, I think I'm up to issue three in the scripts. Wow! Uh, and. Who's that for? And it's gonna be boom again, one okay. more time. Boom Studios. If you got um, that relationship with them, that's good. You continue. Yes, that. that's right. Yeah, it, it it's been very positive, and they've been very supportive, uh, and like open to doing this, doing this thing, and take it where taking it where it goes. Um, and so, it feels good to have. And and you know, and and uh, uh, I liked how things ended up with Destroyer, so I felt like okay, let's do another one. Good. And they felt the same. So thank thankfully. All right. Ed? Uh, on, on, and Ed, your novel's out now. Yeah, it is out. Uh, it, and What's the future project as well. 
Uh, future projects. Uh, I've actually started a sequel to the first novel. Okay. Um, the, a, and um, there will be there'll be an audio version of the current book. And I, because it was, my novel was conceived to be an illustrated book. Uh, actually, Tim, uh, you, you, of course, played a role in the form that Dread Isle, in, in which Dread Isle appears now, right? Where, right, it, it has this very subdued, uh, I think of it as kind of a literary fiction cover. Okay. Uh-oh. Okay, did he break up? Let's see if he pops back in. Okay, let's see if he pops back in. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I'll say this into is he back? Okay, don't worry about it. But anyway, so do I'm gonna say this. Um, what do you think is gonna happen over the next year or two with this stuff? Because this stuff is obviously going crazy. With, with the whole stuff. Yeah, but yes. Lovecraft Country. You know, if an item is crazy, I would consider that as part of everything that's going on. What do you think is going to happen over the next two or three years? I mean, I think the nice thing is like, uh, um, I mean, to be crass again, like I think the, the good thing has been like, it's been amazing stuff. But there's, as you've said earlier, there's been amazing stuff before. That's it's right. amazing stuff. And there are actually now clear signs of an audience. That's right. Right. And that there's access like the streamers allow. I mean, like Lovecraft Country in the days of uh, four channels. Oh, you know what I mean? To go that far back. It never would have happened. And so exactly. one of the glories, I hope one of the glories of Lovecraft Country and how particularly like that Hippolyta episode and how far it went is is to sort of say like uh, like it began as horror. But it clearly, I think, by the second episode at the you know or certainly toward the end like you understood this it's afrofuturism there's elements of horror there's elements of sci-fi right. there's right. but it's all under that umbrella right um and the like positive critical attention the obvious um viewership it got like uh i would love for that to be rather than you know in the past like uh that sense like there's blips of things mm -hmm. right i would really love it if it started to feel like no 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 like all these things sort of come together and they form an island do you know and you need a lot of different pieces of land to so, create that island so let me say this the one thing that's interesting uh, i mentioned it in my lit hub article literary hub article today so yeah. back in october i was brought in by unesco the, the mm -hmm. first UN, right and it was about 30 of the baddest afrofuturists on the planet some of them were scholars academics writers it was me and maybe about one or two of the visualists mm -hmm. and for about a week we met every day on this mural board and oh. the thing was we did a thing called the future black america mm -hmm. and uh when you see that happening i'm telling yeah. you something's here it's it's real it's not yes. you know that's why i'm so grateful to have done this book at this particular moment in time uh because the world knows and when you start getting governmental agencies involved in it that's when things change right and that's what's happening it's like even uh, i was talking with my uh, friend uh Kenitra, uh brooks yeah sure yeah yeah one of the professors at michigan state and you know hopefully she'll be writing something on infinitum but she did she was basically writing this fairly dense pop scholarship Mm -hmm. every week on lovecraft country yeah i remember that and you just you just begin to realize that there's this whole thing of of so many different ways to create content around afrofuturism yes that just not the project itself but extending out from that i mean hell my wife is a playwright she's not an afrofuturist play yeah it, and it's 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 just so many different opportunities to tell stories both in the past, present, and future. And I think, uh, I think, because streaming is not going away. We can agree with that. Streaming is not going anywhere. That's yes. That's Maybe right. we'll some kind of VR thing. Maybe we'll have little nods and stuff popping out like an infinitum and stuff. We'll have green eyes and stuff. <laughs> That'll happen. But uh, we'll be drooling from our mouths and stuff while we're watching <laughs> that type of thing. 
But uh, I think, I think the, what I love about it, and I was saying this to Angelique uh, Roche the other day when we were in conversation, that as the demographics of the country and the world have changed, the content will change along with it. So what, mm -hmm. charge the feminist bookstore. I think you're going to have even more of that, but you're going to have it on a much more mainstream level. Right. It's mainstream now. I mean, don't get me wrong, but it's going to be bigger. Now you're going to have, imagine a feminist barbarian black Xena, but like Game of Thrones. Yes. I, I, I want to see that. I, I can try, but guys, you know, I'm limited. So <laughs> we, we need somebody to put that together for us, if y'all don't mind. I'm willing to, to pay extra on my Disney Plus account or whatever. <laughs> to get it made. I'm willing to, to go buy Barnes and Nobles and buy buy that book. There is one more question that's been submitted. Okay. If you had an opportunity to collaborate with any artist, dead or alive, any ah. medium, who would it be? Is that for both of us or just? Uh, uh, yeah, both the artists. You, you start, please, right please. Uh, okay. So there are five people I would like to collaborate with. <laughs> the ones who are dead is I only talked with her once for a two hour long conversation, Octavia Butler back in 1992. I was in Oregon for the basketball tournament of the Americas and we talked for two hours. Wow. And I wish I could have met her in person and drawn something. Uh, that's one. Two, Samuel R. Delaney is still alive. <laughs> <laughs> and I was in conversation with Sam or Chip two days ago about finishing the story that I started for uh, uh, our friend uh, 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 Khadijah George for her book called A Sable Literary Magazine. It's a 10-page story that I did of Chip because Chip writes these incredible Facebook posts. Yes. Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, he, he threw me for a loop. He said, look at the, the post below this one and, and, and Dad will give you your answer. And I read it and I was like, this is about some guy a Spencer, a poet. What's it have to do with me? <laughs> you know, but that's Chip, right? That's, that's him. Chip. Yes, that's right. That's no, you know, you just the you know he's a genius that way. He can't help himself. But so I would love to do Nova. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, that thing. That's the thing. Uh, I would like to work with this other guy. His name is Vic. One day, but you know he's busy with these boom projects. <laughs> And he teaches at Columbia University. So he ain't like, got time for me. He ain't got time for me. I mean, what one of his books like available for like the the National Book Award or something like that? This guy, he's pretty well known. But you know, he, he wouldn't he wouldn't rock with me. I would I, rock. I, I would rock. No, you I wouldn't. Can't, yeah, I can't put my finger on who you're talking about. I'm just so guy. slow. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so I, I I would do that. Uh I have a book uh uh with my wife. I'm hearing the clearing of the voice in the background here. <laughs> We're doing called Sky Blue Beetle. Don't worry, I'm gonna get it done. I heard that, babe. And uh 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 I I want to do that, but I have about 29 books on my personal list of books, IPs that I want to produce, and it's gonna take about 15 years to do them all, 15 to 20 years. Hopefully yeah. I live that long. Yeah. Here's hoping. Here's hoping, indeed. Victor, you, you, you want to answer that question? Well, I would say, I mean, so we brought her up already, but I mean, I don't know what form it would take, but Alice Coltrane, I would love to have, uh, to produce something where, uh, uh, I mean, I feel like words would uh, pale in comparison to her music, but, that would be a dream of some kind or to have her score if i like if i was uh making a, sh a movie or a show to have her score something would be uh a dream from out of the the past for certain mm -hmm. and then uh you know since you were talking about it, I, it's funny it's like as you were mentioning uh tim infinitum as a tv show i was really just sort of like huh maybe i could get in the writer's room on hey infinitum. man hey man so, hey man do I, this is the one thing I don't want to do 
if it's ever so, and I believe it will because that's just where we are. Yes. I do not want to be a passive creator. I don't want to just sell a project and be, you know, oh, it's an option. Okay, I'm just waiting. Nope. I want to be in the writer's room. Yes. Just like Ty Frank and Daniel Abraham on The Expanse. Those guys in the writer's room. Mm -hmm. and they are one, done just the, you know, the, the, the yeah. compensation. That's one thing. But the really important thing is that they're able to create yet another project that has their soul into it. That's right. That's so that's right. what I want. That, because, you know, I, I'm, I'm a comic guy, but I'm a film guy too. I'm an animation yeah. guy, and I want to play in all those different forms. Oh, by the way, to, uh, Kamasi Washington. He can do that. Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. Kamasi Washington can do what you want. I had to say that when, as soon as you were talking about Alice, I was like, okay, Kamasi Washington. You just got to put those harps in there. Yes, right. That's right. Brand, what's up? Brandy Younger could do that. She could do that part. Hopsicolis. Hopsicolis. Since you brought it up already, I will, I will respond to the question myself okay. by saying I would love to see Nova made as a movie. I tried. Um, so I we tried. would, we would, I think we would have to uh, like kidnap all the WGBH executives because they're never going to let anything else in the world that's not an exploding star be called Nova. But there's just no other title for that that Delaney book, and so that's what it should be called. Nope. So. And yeah, you should have a hand in that, Tim. You you should you should take a you should take a crack at the screenplay, Victor. Yeah. So, yeah, it. we will see. So, uh, how much? Uh, I don't know how much time we have left. Yeah, I I'm not, I'm uncertain myself. I I I thought it was an hour and a half event. I, I think an hour and a half I was what I was. Questions. Okay, so we got another. Uh, four Five minutes, minutes, maybe. So let me say this. Uh, I, I would like to speak for at least a minute. Hit it. The last three days have absolutely been life altering and transformative. I've never had a book birthday. I've never had that. I was so stressed out and so nervous because, you know, there was nothing really planned for my book birthday. You know, thing, everything before and after, sure. But there was nothing on the day. And uh, I have to give tremendous thanks to Angelique Roche for interviewing me uh, because she didn't have to do that. That's the first thing. The other thing was I went to Barnes & Noble and I signed my books with illustrations, just Facebook Live thing. And to have that experience and to see the tons of people who have just taken photos, man, of my book and like, yo, look what I just got in the mail. You know, I got, you know, hey, man, you know, look what look, look what just came in Amazon. I got I got my book. And people as far away as 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 you know, the West Coast, Clarksdale, Mississippi, all over the country. Uh it has been now I don't know what the item is gonna do. You know, I get bomb. I don't know. I don't know. But all indications say that it's going to do well. But beyond that, this has been one of the happiest, most personally and privately and professionally fulfilling experiences of my life. And I just want to thank, I, you know, the readers. I want to thank, you know, I guess I have a few fans. I want to thank the, the Twitter folks. I want to thank everybody who, you know, because nobody has to buy, you know how it is, Victor, you know, mm -hmm. it, nobody has to buy your book. You know, they don't have to. You know what I mean? And, and I appreciate people loving the images. You know what I mean? You know, how many books have you done, Victor, at this point? Like six? Uh, yes, seven, I think. Seven, okay, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> so, you know, it's probably a little bit old hat for you. Never. But, oh, really? Not anymore. It used okay. to be. Oh, really? I used to take it. Uh, I, I didn't used to enjoy it when it happened. Oh, really? Uh, I would say for the first book, I uh, was too busy thinking about what else I deserved how, or what else I wanted. Oh, out of it. well, you know? I'm going to say this. I have enjoyed this, boy. This I'm so happy. Dude. That is dude. the way it should be. Dude, dude, it's like 
yeah, they always say, man, I wish this would happen. But then there are things I know I can't talk about, right? Right. Dude, it has just gone better than I could have possibly imagined. It has just been, you know, you dream of something happening and then it happens. Has that ever happened to you guys? What's that? You they dream, you dream of it and then it makes it happen. Yeah, and it happened. Have you all ever had that happen? Oh, uh, I I had it happen uh, a backward way. I my fictional <laughs> alter ego, right? Yeah, yeah. My my fictional alter ego I created for a role playing game, and originally he had just a, a, a last name, right? Okay. He was just Growl, and uh, the guy who was running the game said, "Does he have a first name?" I said, "Mister." And a few nights later, I had a dream in which a disembodied hand signed the name. Hughes, like Hughes Rudd, H-U-G-H-E-S, wow. Hughes Warren Growl. Wow. And that's how my fictional alter ego was born. And he, he shows up in everything under different guises. <laughs> uh, so, but but what I, it took me years to realize that like this half black, half German dude was like mm -hmm. a one-man race riot, wow. right? But the Hughes is also H-U-E-S. Warren is also warring. So, yeah. I'm sorry to have to do it, folks, but I'm going to have to head out and get these kids to bed. I'm so sorry. This has been no. such a gift. Victor, you have five seconds. Pleasure, man. You you have five seconds. Can you do a thumbs up so I can take a screenshot, man? Do a thumbs up. Do a thumbs up. All right. Oh, sorry. Run one. No, no. Do it again. Got it. <laughs> hey, congratulations, Tim. And thank, thank you, man. I owe you. Oh, you know, you know, you know, this is uh, get, this was my uh, pleasure, truly. And like, Thank uh, you. Mine too. all right, good night, everybody. All right. Take good care. Night. All right. So, uh, uh, Ed, I think uh, with that, uh, is uh, uh, is there anything else? Because we can close out another minute or so. Yeah, I, uh, I I feel like that's everything. Unless there's anything that that you wanted to get out into the world that I did not ask you about, or no, I'm good. Uh, go to dieselfunk.com. Go to timfielder.com. Go to infinitumbook.com. Go to uh, harpercollins.com and look up infinitum. It's some people call it infinitum, but it's really infinitum because I'm from down south. Uh, you want to follow me on social? Facebook is Diesel Funk or Tim Fielder. Uh, Twitter is Diesel Funk. Instagram is Diesel Funk. And uh, uh, Twitch, we're working on Diesel Funk. We're going to get that one through Watch. We're going to get that one too. And you can go ahead and order Infinitum from Keras. Just click this teal button right down here. It's ready to go. We'll ship it right out to you. Or if you're local in Atlanta, we'll put it on the front porch in a little bag for you. Uh, so you can get it tomorrow if you don't already have it. And if you already pre-ordered it from us, it's in the mail on the way to you if it hasn't already arrived at your doorstep. Um, thank you, Ed, for always being such a great moderator. Thanks, Ed. Really appreciate it, man. Conversation partner. And um, Tim, thank you. And congratulations. It's always thank good you. to hear that uh, people's book birthdays go well. Uh, so we're glad to hear that. Um, and we look forward to all the all the good things coming, coming your way from this. We know it's going to be huge. So yeah. um, thank you also to everybody at home watching. And thank you especially to the Auburn Avenue Research Library and our research librarian friends who make the chat amazing.